recording. Thanks, Jill. And to be honest, uh, Stephen, I'm not sure I got the agenda for today, uh, unless it was just the open item of the risk assessment. I, I did get that email, but did, did we have a formal agenda? There is I'm, not a formal agenda other okay. than the standards discussion of the risk assessment and pretrial services unit. Okay, great. All right. Stephen, I, I, I mean, I think the, the one item that we do have with the risk assessment is our meeting scheduled for Friday with Adam and, and Damani. I don't know if you want to update the group on that. You've been kind of the, the lead point person on that. Um, sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Thank you, Judge Freeman. Um, just as background for everybody, uh, as we move toward adopting and implementing the public safety assessment from Arnold Ventures, and we've begun using that for pretrial release decisions to inform judicial officers. Uh, we've understood the importance from Dr. Andrew Peterson of uh, validating the outcomes of, of that implementation uh, after we've assembled uh, an adequate number of cases to really have any statistical significance. And, and we wanted to keep a particularly close eye on whether we were uh, exacerbating any uh, racial or ethnic disparities um, in, in the use of that. So uh, partly as a result of feedback from the community, and this was quite a while ago in a meeting that Judge Garrett convened, um, we agreed uh, to try to incorporate community members in that post-implementation validation assessment process, which will be a periodic kind of thing that Dr. Peterson will help us with, not a one-shot uh, uh, checkbox uh, that we'll be satisfied with. So uh, after a lot of thought and a lot of planning, um, We've uh, got tentative engagement with two community members uh, who, A, have credibility on the ground uh, with, with affected communities, who have some awareness of uh, racial equity issues within the criminal legal system, um, and who have the time and interest and and sophistication, I would say, I guess, uh, to participate with whatever group of us does that uh, validation assessment. Um, thanks to Judge Freeman's contact, Damani Johnson just retired from the faculty at Western Washington University, a person of color himself, a leader in the community on racial issues. Um, for a long time, uh, has agreed to talk with us about uh, taking part in that process. And uh, Adam Fryer, uh, a younger person who is a, also a person of color, a case manager in the LEAD program uh, with Melora Christensen, CMAR and the County Health Department um, and works with our uh, population uh, who would be facing potential pretrial release decisions is also willing to engage in that process. So to, to sort of prep Damani and Adam for that, uh, Judge Freeman, Judge Garrett, and I will be uh, having a Zoom meeting with Damani and Adam on Friday over the noon hour to just prepare them for what that process is. Um, Dr. Peterson, to my knowledge, is not involved in that meeting at this point. Um, I'm not sure when we'll actually undertake that evaluation process. I think that really is up to Dr. Peterson and Judge Freeman and Judge Garrett. Um, but we'll try to answer questions that Damani and Adam have about the process, what their role would be, and what, what our expectations uh, would be for their participation. I, I've tried to give them some background information um, and we'll see where our conversation goes. 
Um, and I'd invite any additional comments that Judge Freeman or Judge Garrett have on that or questions from the rest of the, of the work group. Well, I would, I just wanna thank you, Stephen, for getting back to Damani and Adam with some of their questions leading up to the meeting. I, I was trying to field some of those directly with, with Damani. I know he has a lot of questions regarding the data and how, what that will look like in post implementation data and what we're comparing it to. I felt like you did a very good job of uh, kind of summarizing that and giving him a, a good representation of where we're coming from. And I'm hoping Judge Garrett can also provide quite a bit of the historical background uh, in Friday's meeting as well, because I know there are going to be questions about the, the history of the implementation as well, which predates my, my service on, on the committee. Oh, and you're muted, Judge Garrett. There, now can you hear me? It, it's funny, the, the sign for mute is not clear whether it's implemented or not. Anyway, yes, I'll be happy to give that historical perspective and I'm looking forward to our meeting on Friday. Yeah. And to thank you also, Stephen, for the work that you've done getting all this together. Yeah. So what's on our agenda for today? We actually don't have a formal agenda. Um, I, I think the items, it was generally the discussion about the uh, risk assessment tool. And I, I do recall one of the things that we talked about at our last meeting was just when we would start looking or receiving data. Uh, and I know we don't have Dr. Peterson on the, the call today, but I don't know if we have any update as to when we will start seeing some, some data coming in from him. That would be a question for John, I would think, or for Dave. Well, I'll answer it from uh, John here. Uh, we compile whatever information he needs and we send it to him, then he'll give the statistics and the, you know, the details of it. But uh, as for, I think he's collecting on new arrests while on pretrial and, um, and new pending charges, I think are some of the statistics and the number of cases since well, pretrial has started back 2019. So I believe he's collecting those, that information Dr. Peterson is. So he's, is he getting it directly from, wh where's he getting it from? He's if collecting he it himself on the database as well as anything we catch, we send it to him and he compares it to see if he's missed anything. And it's usually uh, tracing the cases that are logged into our county. So it's through case numbers, I believe, a lot of his data gathering is, and that's what we do too. It seems to be the most accurate. <clears throat> okay, Dave Reynolds, anything to add to that? No, I don't have anything to add, thanks. Okay. And hi, it's nice to see or hear all of you. Feels like it's been a while, yeah. Good to see you too. Good. Hi, Maya. Could I ask one question, Judge Garrett? Um, and, and I'm not sure if this is for Dave or for John or for both, but uh, very early on in our work, you did an excellent job of articulating the mantra for this work group, which was, unless we have tiered options for uh, pretrial monitoring uh, upon release, um, what instrument we use and what decisions we make are are not going to be as effective as they could be. And so I know we've been stymied in what uh, pretrial monitoring service we've been able to provide. And I, I, I guess I'd appreciate the group hearing a status report on that. Uh, uh, any, any suggestions of a timeline for, for really going back to a uh, uh, you know, some, some, some oversight that, that reflects a, a risk scoring uh, that a judicial officer might take account of, just where we stand with that, because our implementation won't really be complete or effective without that. That makes sense. I, I think that would be a question for uh, Judge Freeman or for Dave Reynolds. Um, I don't really know what the status of uh, pre-trial proceedings 
is. I, I know that at the beginning of the COVID crisis and going on two years ago now, uh, the Supreme Court ordered that pretty much anybody who could be safely released, safely meaning community danger as opposed to risk of not appearing, be released. And that resulted in a, a, a lot of releases that might not have happened otherwise. But I don't know where, where we are on that, whether that order is still in effect and what our jail population's been lately. Can one of you kind of update us on that and on uh, status of pretrial services? Big question, I know. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure the work group is aware that as far as first appearances go, that 99% of the time is handled by our commissioners. And I have had conversations with the commissioners about the use of the, the risk assessment. I have not asked specific questions as to the their setting as far as uh, the different levels of supervision. So I would actually love to see that as well. And maybe we can get that from either John or Dave uh, at our next meeting, just to see where the spread is as far as the use of, of the different levels of supervision, because quite honestly, I, I don't know um, how much that has been been used. I, I am confident that they, they are reviewing the, the risk assessment tool prior to, to setting bail. Um, and we are still guided by Supreme Court order uh, as far as warrants. Bail is a little bit different than what it was, but I will say our jail population numbers have been running higher uh, recently, as well as the difficulty. I know we just got an email about a week ago because of another outbreak of COVID in the jail um, and having to quarantine certain populations, it reduces their ability as far as maximum capacity as well. So we are dealing with some of that uh, being a factor right now as well. Dave Reynolds, anything to add? Yeah, I'll just let John uh, speak to the, uh, he, I think he has a pretty good feel for who's being placed on what level of supervision and how many how many people are being placed on. So you wanna to speak to that, John? Uh, yes. Um, so we got, right now we got about 120 total. <clears throat> that covers all three levels. And 65% of those are on medium level. Uh, 25% are on uh, low, and then a, what is it, about 10% left is on high level. And to see the corresponding, uh, how they use it on first appearances, I don't know if there's any correlation. Mediums just seems to be the, kind of the, for most cases to go into. Uh, criminal history, or no matter what they say, I guess what I'm trying to say is the score and the level they're put on, I don't see a correlation yet between the judicial officers and assigning in pretrial services, if that makes sense. It doesn't. Um, and Maya, I'm gonna, we are gonna wanna hear from you and from Kellen as well, if he's with us uh, about your respective office's take on things. But uh, my question is for John, I, I don't understand what you mean about the, the lack of correlation or the lack of information about correlation there. Could you just? Yeah. Um, a little bit? Yeah. When they're assigned, uh, it's by the judicial officer, but I have no correlation to why they put them on medium, low, or high. If they score, let's say high and they're put on medium, or if they score low and they're put on high, uh, I've seen that. So I don't have anything. It's just a simple decision that. Right. I don't but, have the correlation. Why? And purposefully. We don't, we don't want judicial officers, you know, tied into the score on the, uh, the risk assessment tool necessarily. I mean, we don't wanna make it so coercive that they have to explain uh, a decision that doesn't correlate to the score. So, I mean, we might get to that point, I suppose, but we haven't started out with that perspective. So, okay. And um, it, before I ask, Maya and uh, Kellen, if they have any comments, are you finished with the information you're giving us, John? Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and I'd like to hear perspectives from uh, Maya's office and Kellen's office as well on the current status. Well, I actually had a question for John as well, because I am curious about, I didn't, I, I was left with the understanding that pretrial services are an alternative to money bail. Where I, how I see them being used is in addition to money bail. And I'm 
want to know if that's just me anecdotally seeing that or if that's in fact what's happening because I think that is what's happening. Well, some have bail, some are PR'd and that's up to the judicial officer. Uh, if bail's lowered because of a higher score or something or put on pretrial, I don't know. But, uh, but, but am I right in the understanding? And I thought the premise of it was that pretrial supervision was an alternative to money bail. Like that, I thought was written into, is, am I just totally, I, I mean, I believe I read that somewhere in some policy stuff. Not, Does anybody agree with me or disagree with me about that concept? It could be an overarching concept through the, the national push, but locally, this local jurisdiction hasn't really put it in policy. Other jurisdictions maybe in the state have, but not here that I know of. I, I think we have not tracked that. Um, I think we did see this process as being especially effective in imposing conditions on people who um, aren't able to, to come up with bail money. So that was our goal. Um, we've purposely left a lot of discretion to the judicial officers who are making those decisions. And we certainly have not proscribed uh, financial costs in, in addition to um, in addition to the pretrial conditions that would come with the pretrial uh, order. So I guess that's it kind of come down on both sides of the alternatives that you're asking Maya. It was our, our view and our goal to um, make release financially feasible for people who, who can't simply come up with money bail. Um, and if that means simply pretrial conditions with uh, no money bail, that's what it means. But we did not say no money bail is permitted if pretrial conditions are imposed. And frankly, I'd hesitate to do that because I think in some circumstances, that's you know, a plan that, that makes sense because it gives the defendant um, some financial incentive. Obviously, if it's beyond the defendant's financial reach though, that defeats the purpose of this project. So how's that for an indefinite answer? Yeah, Stephen? Uh, yeah, that's the question to me. Um, I, I'm thinking back and, and when I get into the area of memory, that's always a, a, an iffy proposition, but part of the early stages of our work was, was reference to a criminal rule procedure, what is it, 3.2, where, where bail is supposed to be a last resort and it's supposed to be based on a determination of the ability to pay. And so I, I completely agree with, with Maya's characterization that this, this was a, a reduction of incarceration measure recommended by the Vera Institute, and it was intended to uh, allow uh, release of people who couldn't afford bail um, as long as there were reasonable predictions that they'd return to court and, and the community would be safe with them circulating uh, during that period of time. So I, I, I don't, I, I mean, the question to me is, are the judicial officers making an indigency assessment um, when, when they're imposing bail on top of release conditions? And I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, uh, one, one would hope. Um, and I, uh, I don't disagree with the overreaching aspect that Maya summarized. Uh, at the same time, it was the way, and I, I came in at a very interesting time because it was literally, I, I think I began about the week we implemented this and, and within about three weeks, the judges were covering the first appearances for the commissioners. So for a, a, the initial period where we were actually using it, even during COVID and the judges were covering the calendar, we were actually implementing it, although it was a very small window. But I do recall that it was, certainly conveyed that this was not a, uh, a suggestion of bail or not. And, and what the risk assessment didn't provide was whether bail should be imposed. And that was conveyed to me and I, I'm sure the commissioners as well uh, early on. 
And so I do see areas of overlap where there might be a good reason to impose an amount of bail and the, the conditions, but I, I don't disagree with the overriding principles that, that Maya conveyed. All right. Kellen, do you have any input on this? I mean, I guess as far as the pretrial services aspect of it, I've seen it kind of used both ways by the commissioners where they're at times explicitly saying, well, we can PR this person if they're on pretrial services and, and using it kind of in the way Maya talked about. And I've also seen them put them put bail in pretrial services on. And, you know, I don't want to get inside the head of the commissioners too much, but presumably they're putting less bail on because of the additional condition of pretrial services. And I don't know that we necessarily want to take that option away if it actually is reducing bail, even if they decide that some bail is necessary. But, you know, it's it's hard to know exactly what the thought process is, and I'm sure each commissioner kind of thinks about it differently, too. Is it possible, John or Dave, for us to get information about the number of cases in which uh, both pretrial conditions and bail have been imposed so that we can get a better sense of when that's happening? I think John should have that information as well as whoever's being placed on that's not making bail and remaining in jail, because they'd still, still be assigned pretrial, but it hasn't been released yet. Yeah, um, John, just will ask that would, be, <clears throat> that would be time, that'd take time because we got to go into case by case into the database and review paperwork. And well, let me ask you for an estimate. I mean, just at this point from your current, you know, just current knowledge, do you have, are you working with people who have been ordered pretrial services but are incarcerated? We have a handful of those like that because uh -huh. they have, they haven't made bail, I guess. They haven't made or, bail. Or they could be being held on a district court matter or something else too. All right. And Maya, what's your sense of does your office have clients who are ordered pretrial service but are in jail because they can't make a bail? Um, I I don't know the answer to that, and I I don't do first appearances very frequently anymore. I um, I don't know that we would pay much attention to it because if they're in custody, they're not doing any of the pretrial. You know, like that doesn't really trigger unless they're released. So. It's not really a conversation we'd be having with our clients about like, hey, make sure you're checking in because they don't need to. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I feel like there's in terms of collecting data and analyzing like what are the effects of this program, I feel like, and maybe Dr. Peterson is collecting this, but I mean, I think it is, I, I hope he's collecting like when they're imposing the conditions and money bail, what types of charges are those and who are the people that are getting both? You know, like, is it mostly people of color who are getting both money bail and pretrial conditions? Like those are the kinds of data I, I hope we're looking for here. Um, and, and I'm a little concerned that John's suggesting we'd have to go back and look case by case, like, shouldn't we be collecting that data? Um, we shouldn't have to go back and look at every case to determine that. Right. Well, I'm um, remember when we started this project, our goal was to reduce incarceration. And we defined part of the problem as being that when money bail is imposed, there's a whole economic group of people who don't have that option. Um, and we wanted to go through that group and uh, figure out who should be incarcerated really, um, even if they um, are poor and who's incarcerated, who doesn't have to be, who could be released with some uh, more, uh, less onerous conditions like pretrial conditions. That's what we came up with. Um, and that's why we started pretrial conditions. Um, if there is a, an unintentional racial discrimination element in that, in, in just the question of who gets both pretrial conditions and bail. Um, that's something we'd wanna look at, but it was not what we had in mind when we um, started this project. What we had in mind was reducing incarceration across the board in, in a way that was uh, 
racially and eth ethnically and uh, gender wise equitable. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we don't have that information about who gets bail and pretrial conditions at all. Um, it can be retrieved, but I'm, I'm not surprised it has to come from individual um, individual records. I, I don't know. I mean, I, what I'm hearing from you and from Kellen is that you have a sense that this is going on, but you don't have exact numbers. And John is telling us that he has a sense that this is going on too, but he doesn't have exact numbers. So I, I'm not sure what the extent of the problem is and what kinds of cases they involve. I mean, it seems to me that in some cases it would make sense to for the judicial officer to impose both bail and pretrial conditions. Bail at a at a re, an amount reduced from what it would otherwise be, I imagine. I just wanted to add, when we look at the numbers, depending on where we're pulling them from, because there's been discussion about, you know, does John have individuals that are in the jail right now that have these conditions? We need to look at first appearance numbers, not the progression of the case, because there are a number of cases that come back on, on review of release conditions and bail is imposed and, and we don't necessarily remove the, the pretrial conditions, the pretrial monitoring conditions. So. You mean when it comes back on review because there's been some sort of violation? Correct. Or it's appealed to the judge? No, you typically for a violation. And so I just want to make sure that we're looking at first appearance numbers where both are being set versus yeah. bail being set later on. Yeah. That yeah. might skew our numbers a bit. Well. I just wanted to say, too, I believe Dr. Peterson is collecting some of the demographics for some of the information he's collecting. So I, I, I believe he's trying to look at the gender and uh, racial parts. So I, I believe that's still part of his, he's got that database and he's collecting those things. Okay, well, without imposing uh, an, any further assignments on Dr. Peterson, can we give homework to John and Dave Reynolds that you'll check with Dr. Peterson and uh, find out what he has in the way of information about this. It may be that that information is just there and uh, and we can get it from him. If not, let's discuss this issue again at our next meeting and figure out if we wanna look for that data in a more organized way. Just to let you all know, I did hear from Dr. Peterson this morning. He wasn't able to attend today, but he did encourage all of you if you have questions to let him know and he'll get answers for you. I will, as soon as I get this meeting posted up on YouTube later on today, we'll send the link to him and I'm um, fairly confident he'll probably take a look at it as well to hear the discussion and what your questions are. Okay, thank you, Jill. Anybody else wanna to speak to this issue? Okay, I think at this point we've, I've heard comments on various things from everybody except Jake Wiebush. And Jake, I just wanna acknowledge that you're here. Thank you for coming and um, let you know you're not being ignored here. If you have any any input, just speak up. Oh, thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, okay. Um, any other input on the discussion, um, particularly from your office, Maya, or your office, Kellen? Okay. Will you, when you meet with um, Adam and Damani, who I, I, I know them through other, you know, I don't know, other things, other committees or whatever, would you please let them know that they are welcome to contact me independently if they wanna talk about like my perspective, just and get, they're welcome to call or email me, thanks. You bet. And Kellen, um, can they contact you independently if they want to talk about the perspectives of your office? Sure, absolutely, yeah. Okay, good. We'll give them uh, contact information for both of you. Good, all right. So what, what's the, what's the, what are the jail numbers now? I thought I heard John say somewhere around 100 What's the population, 125 or so? 
Do we know? I get a report on Monday so I can pull that up. Thank you. And I'll just say, I talked with Wendy Jones yesterday, I think, and you know, she's struggling over there because we've got a lot of people who are dealing with mental health issues who require solo housing. So a lot, she said 35 of her beds are taken up right now with folks who cannot be housed with other people. And that's causing a big, that's very difficult for them. Um, you know, the, the, in general, sort of like the population of the jail free trial is quite high and it's for serious cases, as is not really a big surprise when there hasn't been trials and trials have been sort of slowly eking out. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's sort of the feedback, recent feedback I've had on they're, they're feeling very congested with very difficult people. That makes sense. So the numbers are lower, but the intensity of needed care is quite a bit higher, sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can tell you that there were 155 houses in the downtown jail as of Monday. Uh, and it looks like 63 at the work center. Again, that's as of Monday. We, we also have started getting an aging report, like Maya had indicated. Um, and I did note, and I can't pull that one up right now. I think I, the last one I got was last week, but um, it did appear that we were getting some older cases at this point uh, as far as aging and more individuals have been there for longer uh, than the last update I got, which was granted a couple months ago, probably. And then there was also additional concern either this week or last with that minor outbreak that they had been dealing with, that it reduces their ability to kind of quarantine in the main jail. And not their ability to quarantine. They do quarantine. It's it's the kind of the maximum housing that they can afford when when they're dealing with an outbreak. So that was a concern. Yeah, and I think you guys should just know and understand like our some of the obstacles we have to communicating with our clients during COVID. I mean, we I pushed and got Perry and I and tech and um, facilities to create what we call Cal, which is confidential attorney line. Um, in the downtown jail, which is a video visitation, only one person can, one client can use it at a time. There's only one booth for it. Um, you know, we are, as the attorneys, you know, we're, we're, we're often in court at the same time and then we're free at the same time. So there is a, a struggle with like, like sometimes a struggle with trying to book that time with only one facility. And you know, the clients, we can't access them between 12 and two because, or excuse me, 12 one when there's like a two hour time in the middle of the day when they're lunch and head count and we're not allowed to talk to them so there's like limitations on our access to our clients but the what is a big problem is that they haven't put in the cal unit at the work center despite i can't even tell i mean i don't even know a year i've been asking i mean i think we're like this close to finally having it up at the work center but like until today, we couldn't go to the work center because they moved some quarantine people, COVID folks from the jail to the work center. So then that meant we couldn't go to the work center because their ventilation out there means everybody gets it if anybody gets it. So we won't go there if there's positive, like, so there's, it's just, there's every day, like I'm talking to the jail, they're talking to me and I thank God they're very communicative at, with us and keep us up to date. But I mean, I'm sending out constant missives to my people. Nope, you're not allowed to go in the jail. Right now we can't go into the downtown jail, maybe next week. I'll have to check with Caleb. But so our, our like, otherwise we have these phones that are not confidential because our clients are in a holding cell with other inmates. So their end isn't confidential. So it's, it's been like truly our office demanding and pushing and trying to get funding like out of nowhere to like create these structures that would allow us to have communication with our clients in custody. It's not been good. And I, it's still not even done, you know? <laughs> like if there's another outbreak at the work center and Perry can't go there to finish this project, which is what has keeps happening, um, we're adrift at the work center. We have no means of confidential communication with our clients at the work center, like none. And so that, that's a big deal. And we've been dealing with it, but I feel oftentimes like we're just treading water. And I would think that, and I mean, the court, I think should be concerned about access to counsel. Um, and it's a fight we fight, but I don't really hear anybody else in that fight. 
Thanks. Dave, um, has our court been involved in addressing this situation? Uh, this is news to me, but of course that makes sense since I'm not around anymore. You have anything to add, Dave? If it's Dave Freeman, I, I can just add that we, we it has been an ongoing challenge, um, one that I have personally been involved in when it comes to the work center and ability even to get individuals into the courtroom in a sense, because we didn't, uh, this was a, an issue that just it, due to COVID there, there were structural issues at the work center that prevented us from even, uh, we, we can't use the JAVS device and our courtrooms that are set up for uh, audio video recording. That was a huge issue. I will say, as, as Maya did, that Perry has been extremely responsive when, when he's had to go out there on his own and, and frankly, just bring them a laptop to the work center where I was able to um, get an individual into the courtroom. And, and frankly, I just demanded that they be have a private room available if they needed to speak with their attorney. So to the extent that it occurs in court, the court has been involved to the extent that Maya is, is talking about uh, structurally and then, you know, the access to her clients outside of that courtroom experience, I've been less involved and a little less aware, but I, I am aware that it's a problem because I've, again, had to demand that, that they have a private room to speak to their attorney if they need to, if they're in the middle of a court proceeding. And I do understand that they now, at least during court, and I have an attorney client room that they can use the cell phone privately if, if they need to, but. Well, that's good. But that doesn't resolve the problem that Maya is indicating, which is having access to her clients the rest of the time. I understand. Um, Maya, thank you for explaining that circumstance. And that does um, account for a, a number of gaps in the public defender's information and status. I don't think, and the rest of you can correct me if you disagree, but I don't think that's an issue that our committee uh, is going to take on, but it gives us some context that I appreciate getting. Yeah. And I hope, God, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, the, the pandemic is like the, the pebble in the lake, and then these ripples just keep going out and out and there are way more than any of us would have predicted. Yeah. Well, on that cheery note, um, do we have other items on our agenda, Stephen? Uh, not that I'm aware of. It was sort of the, uh, the open table that Judge Freeman described. Um, Maya, I'd like to just suggest to you that there is a meeting next week, a joint meeting between the legal and justice systems and behavioral health subcommittees. I, I think this would be an appropriate uh, issue to raise there. Um, yeah, I mean, it can explain backlog. You know, I mean, I think, yeah, we don't, it's just still not totally up and running. I don't, it's like, it's hard because I hate to complain because I'm like, I know Perry's really underwater and we're, I mean, I, I email and I mean, I can't, I, it took a very long time to get Cal in the main jail and we still don't have it at the work center. So when people are like, what's causing all the, you know, I mean, there are a lot of reasons that these delays are being are caused, but this is a real one. Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It gives some context to uh, just the struggle that I know it is to, to represent people who have very few resources. Yeah, I mean, and we know that like, I mean, just, I'm really grateful for Cal. Thank God it's there when like, we can't go into the jail. Like we haven't been able to go in there for at least 10 days now and we still have another week that if we didn't have that, I don't know what we would do. But, um, but I also have a lot of clients who just don't work well talking to a TV. You know, they may have some mental health concerns that this does not work for them. And so, it's just, there is no replacing the in-person. Um, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I mean, frankly, if I were charged with crime, I, I might do okay talking to my lawyer virtually 
eventually, but I'd sure like to start out by meeting her. Yeah. Well, the ripple effect, lots of ripples here. Yeah. Stephen, anything further? Are we to the end of our agenda? I think so. Um, so next time we'll report back on this meeting with Damani and Adam, maybe we'll have some data from John and Dr. Peterson. Um, I think that's really the only items of homework that are coming out of this meeting is our meeting with Adam and Damani later this week. And then John and Dave Reynolds will um, talk with Dr. Peterson and find out what we've got on uh, cases in which there's both bail and pretrial conditions. I'm not, uh, I, I'm not saying let's give a further assignment to Dr. Peterson. If he doesn't have that information, um, please, John and Dave, bring that back to us before we make any decisions about what we want to ask him to do. Um, but I, I do think we want to at least find out what we've got on that. And I know speaking for myself, this Wednesday meeting has worked better than Tuesday meetings do at least for the next couple of months. Um, if others feel the same, then, um, well, regardless of how others feel, let's set, uh, let's set a date for another meeting and anybody who objects to it being on a, on a Wednesday, speak up. Otherwise, when do you think we should meet again? Uh, early we do time. have two meetings on the books coming up, one in February, February 9th, which is a Wednesday, and one on April 20th. Okay. Well, I think that should fit our needs. Do others agree? I don't think we need to set a time for another meeting between now and then, but if, if others feel differently. These are noon to one, am I right? Yes, that's correct. February 9th, I'm sorry, what was the April date? April 20. Thanks, I don't think I have invitations in my calendar. Was, um, do you usually send out like a calendar invite? Because I don't have that in. I yeah. do send those out, <clears throat> excuse me. We're uh, in the process of officially setting the task force's calendar for 2022. So probably next week, look for those invitations. Thank you. Okay, and I can tell you now that uh, I'm going to be out of town on February 9th. Um, I don't think you need me necessarily to have the meeting, but um, I will check in with Judge Freeman and or uh, Stephen before before then, so that um, you know, so that at the meeting you can cover everything. I'm going to be out of town and uh, and out of range as well on February 9th. I see you smiling. <laughs> I know I'd be envious too if I were if I knew I was going to be not. Anyway, um, does that cover our our business that we have for today? Well, good to see all of you. Glad to see that you're healthy. Hope hope to see that you're happy as well, and um, hope everybody has great holidays and. Let's all hope that 2022 is a good year for everybody. Yeah. All right. Thank you all.